All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. I have some uh, some things to share with you this morning from my heart, and um, I want to begin by saying thank you all so much for watching and wanting to be with us and uh, um, asking us where we are. Are you preaching? Are you coming on live? We appreciate that. Our prayer is that this ministry is a blessing to you. Um, for believers, we're praying that that these messages um, will really come from the Word of God, um, from us who have prayed and labored over the Scriptures, so we can explain it and and uh, encourage you and apply it to our lives, so so that you can grow in your Christian life and live the victorious Christian life and win others to Christ, make disciples, live for the glory of God. And this ministry also, I hope it is a blessing to those who are seeking, those who might stumble across here. And, and we appreciate you if you say, you know, we we love it. You encourage us. Thank you for the word. Um, but in the, at the same time, you're not really saved yet. You've not really come to Christ. You've not really received Christ in your heart. You've not really repented and and uh, and received him and believed on him for salvation. But you appreciate the messages. Our prayer is for you that um, these message was, messages would be a blessing to you, that they would drive you to Christ, that they would show you your desperate need of a Savior. And there's no one else but Jesus Christ. And there's no one like him. Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So that's our prayer for you. Um, so here's where we are. And uh, before I read the scripture and pray, because listen, I'm going to be really short this morning and I'm going to tell you why right now. OK, as uh, some of you are watching and I appreciate it <clears throat> uh, because it has always been my conviction from the time God called me into the ministry. And boy, what a battle it's been, man, it's been a battle. But anyway, uh, since God called me into the ministry, I remember um, uh, calling my preacher. I needed help and I still do. And I remember calling Dr. Belcher, my preaching professor, and saying, Doc, I appreciate you. You helped me so much, but I'm wearing you out, calling you all the time. I said, can you put me on some other pastors that have learned under you who are up here for me that, that are more local that I can call upon? And he gave me some names, and I appreciate them. They've been mentors to me as well through the years. I can think of three particularly. And then there's one particularly. Uh, uh, that uh, pastor friend of mine that he told me to call and I called him and I can't remember all the questions I had for him, but I remember the one statement he told me, I won't forget this. He, you know, because I was a young pastor in a tough church and I didn't know what to do. And I remember this guy said, you know, the one thing I would say to you, Kenny, is if I don't give you any other advice as a young pastor, the number one thing I would say is, be ready to stand in the pulpit on Sunday mornings. Be ready to stand in the pulpit. Study the word and uh, and and make sure that you're ready to preach the word. And um, I've always believed that. I've always held on to that. I believe what the Bible says in First Timothy that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God as a faithful workman who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly divides the word of truth, handles accurately the word of truth. And that's always been my conviction. So with all of that said, I want to be able to say to you this morning, I'm not ready this morning to do that. Okay. We have had an extremely busy week this past week, not to make excuses, excuses, but just to be honest with you. And, uh, and I'll list a few of them for you. Number one, um, Nikki's dad, and if you would just pray for him, he's in hospice right now. And uh, so um, Nikki has been dealing with that. And um, I just ask that you pray for her and the family and her dad. And uh, some things changed in the last week. And then secondly, uh, my dad um, had another bout with pneumonia and we had to take him to the hospital and he was admitted for a few days. Praise the Lord. He's doing great today. So thank you. But do pray for that. So um, we were dealing with that. In addition to that, I'm dealing with a, a, um, a, a even another job 
that I have taken on to help uh, support the family while I'm able to do this ministry. And on top of that, oh, I'm embarrassed about this one. Okay, so, um, but anyway, I've already put it on Facebook, so some of you might know um, that I'm playing basketball, and I'm I'm 54 years old, and I want to be 24 as far as basketball again, and I'm trying real hard, and so I'm playing in a real league with real referees, real scoreboard, all of that with my sons and their friends. Problem is, most of those guys are athletes in their 20s, and and uh, I was ready to go last week. I really was. I felt good. And then, bam, four minutes into the game, I, I, I have a hamstring tear. I tore my hamstring muscles. Probably a second degree is more than likely what we're thinking. It's all bruised and terrible. So um, yeah, that was my own fault. And I got what I deserved on that, okay? The Lord needed to allow that in my life for other reasons. But anyway, so I've been dealing with that and, and, uh, and another new job that I've taken on just part time, just for some supplement pay, but a lot of help. And, and we've been dealing with our dads. And then thirdly, we had a great time. We were, um, this was planned, but our son had a college visit out of town. And uh, as his parents, we wanted to go with him and be supportive of him and let him visit the college, go on a tour and uh, see what they had to offer. So be praying for Jacob on that one. And so um, we were dealing with that. And uh, it has just been an extremely busy week. And I have not been able to dive into this passage um, to do it justice like I would want to. So what I want to do this morning is give you a little bit of where we are and go over a little bit of it. I do from what I've been able to study and pray over. I want to share some of that with you now. And uh, so that's why I'm saying it'll be short. That's why I'm talking a little longer now, um, sharing with you what's going on. And the second thing I'd like to share with you is this. And I, I know I don't mean to keep beating the same drum, but I just want to say that by the grace of God, and I know I keep sharing this with you, but this is just true. This is just where we are. By the grace of God, through our mobile ministry, hey, and if God wants us to continue doing that for the rest of my ministry, I'm good with it. If he wants us to keep taking, matter of fact, even if he does, even if he wants to give us a building and a, and a, a real church building and, and be able to meet and have church again, um, if he'll let us, I want to continue the mobile ministry even in addition to that. I love taking the gospel to the streets. That's my passion. And I, and I definitely want that to be an extension, even the heartbeat of our ministry. But at the same time, at the, Brother Joe, if you missed my introduction, I apologize. You you picked the wrong Sunday to uh to let your look at this right here. Look at my look at my friend Joe Mickey. Look, I just get this comment from him. Man, come on. Predica is means preach in Spanish. You know how we yell preach. Well, predica. Pastor Whiston, our Hispanic pastor, taught us that. Brother Joe, you picked the wrong Sunday to invite them. I'm just sitting here making excuses and explaining to everybody why I'm just not quite ready to expound all of this passage where we are. I wouldn't be able to do it justice because of the busyness of the week last week, but I got a little bit to say in just a minute, okay? So thank you, brother. I appreciate all of y'all watching. I really do. Um well, maybe, 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 Joe, maybe there's a reason you got them watching because I'm getting ready to say this. With all of that said, I love the mobile ministry. I love taking the gospel to the streets. But listen, we've been able, uh, you know, we've been doing a children's ministry for several years, for many years now. And uh, we didn't intend for it just to be a children's ministry. It's always been my passion to stand and preach the word of God and, and uh, to adults teenagers, children, senior adults to all peoples of all races. That's always been my passion. And I'm praying that, that God would grant that and continue to let us be able to do that. But here's the deal. Here's where we are. And I'm not going to go into the details. If you want to know the, the, the details, you can private message me. You can speak to me personally. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And we also have board members that I'll give you their phone numbers and you can call them and, and they'll explain to you also the same thing. But here's where we are. So as doing this mobile ministry and being able to go out and see our children that have been coming to church for years and some of them knew, we've been able to get in the families, in the houses more, praise the Lord. And uh, many of these families want to come to church. They, Many of them ask, hey, when, and, and many of the kids are asking, 
when are we going to meet for real church again? And even uh, even in another job that I've been doing, in addition to the mobile ministry, um, I've ran into to children who were children who used to come to this church as a child, and now they're grown and got one one girl I, I saw the other day. She's now grown and got children of her own. And she said, do y'all still do the church thing like you used to? And I said, you know what? We're praying for a building. When we have a building, we're going to. She wants to come and bring her children. I'm so excited. And we keep running into that. And the families and the adults want to start coming. And in addition to that, we're finding uh, that some of our, um, what shall we call them? Some of our disciples, maybe for lack of a better term, some of our dis disciples, former church members, maybe that's a better way of saying it, from even years ago, we found contact with, and they're like, hey, uh, where's your church? We want to come. You know, we, we, we've been struggling to find a church. We want to come. We need to come back. And with all that, and the burden of my heart is we need to come together. We need each other. We need to pray for one another. We need to hear the word of God preach. We need to encourage one another. So with all of that said, and I know it took me a long time to say it, we're asking you to join us in prayer that if it be the Lord's will, that we would find a building, the right building for us to be able to have for the glory of God for the building of his church, for his glory, and for the reaching of more people for Christ. That is our heart. That is our prayer request. If you can help in any way, please let us know. That is, that's our need right now. That's what we're asking for a place to meet, a place of our own where we can build a church, where God can build his church through us uh, vessels that he could build a church for his glory and reach many more for Christ. That's our prayer. So you be praying for that. That's what we're asking help for right now. If you can support us in any way, if you can partner with us, we would love it. Hey, we also still have uh, in need of gas for the van, insurance payments for the van, insurance payments even for our mobile church. And uh, we still take food and drinks to the, well, not always drinks, but food every week to the children and their families. And uh, we still do that. So as you can partner with us, please contact us. We would let you know more specifically how that can work. All right. With all that said, look with me in Romans chapter seven, Romans chapter seven and verse 23. And I just want to read verses 23 through 25. And just give you a little bit of a commentary and a preview of what we're going to talk about next week. Okay, so Romans chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. And here's what the Bible says. But if I, I'm sorry, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Another word for law there could be principle, this, this, this truth, this principle. Okay, verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So then with the mind, and he's talking about there, my inner self, the new man within me, that new life within me that God has created, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just pray in these remaining minutes that we have that you would help us, that you would help your servant to preach faithfully your word, what we have here, and that you would help those who are listening, that you would open their ears, open their minds, open their hearts to the truth. And please don't let the enemy hinder us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So here's what I want to say. First of all, I used to think. Uh, I used to think when I was make sure I get this right. Yeah, there we go. I used to think uh, early in my Christian life and early in my ministry. I'm going back again. And uh, and even throughout the years of my ministry, times of struggles and temptations and failures in my own spiritual journey. 
Don't y'all look so spiritual out there. I'm just kidding. But in my own struggles and temptations and even failures, seasons of failures, yes. I often have questioned, you know, those mentors that God put in my life and especially those mentors that were my professors. There's no way they struggled like I do in the sense that they've given in like I've given in. I see them living much more victorious Christian lives. There's no way. There's got to be a better way. I, I, I must be not disciplined enough. Something's going on that I would have seasons of failure because I certainly don't see such and such brother falling in that or, or failing in thoughts or whatever it might be. And uh, the Lord has since, by the grace of God, revealed to me and grown me in the truth to say, hey, you know what? I don't know what they struggle with. I don't know what they fall in. I don't know. But I do know this, uh, uh, that if we could see the hearts of those that we highly look up to, if we could see their struggles, if we could see their inner failures, uh, maybe we would be surprised. Maybe we would be a little bit more, if I can say this, a little bit more put at ease. Um, with ourselves and not be so hard on ourselves in, in a sense. I'll come back to that in just a moment because I do know this. Uh, the closer a man is to God, the more evil he sees his own heart really is. And the more that struggle is real and the more he mourns. Hey, that's the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, uh, 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 blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn, because the Bible there is really talking about the uh, 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 the heart of a true believer. The, ba the Beatitudes describes the heart and the life of a true believer, the poor in spirit, those who see that they have nothing within themselves. They're um, they're bankrupt within themselves. They need a savior. They 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 understand their sinfulness and their inability to come to God on their own. They understand their need for Christ. Blessed are those who mourn. That's speaking of mourning over my sin and understanding that. Well, that's that's what we're talking about here in this passage, particularly. And that's what we're talking about when we think about those those Christians who we think of as higher up and surely they never fall into sin. But if we could see their hearts and their struggles, we would understand, you know, the closer people get to God, the more the, the struggles might be real and the more that they mourn over that. And if we could talk to the Apostle Paul, particularly, we would find that his struggles and experiences are the same as ours. Um, we would find that um, um, that we would find that those struggles and those battles, I'm sorry. That's something going on here, but we're okay. We would find that his struggles and battles are like mine. Really? And when we read this passage, we see that today. And we we see that in Romans chapter 7. His struggles, his, but really? Paul struggles like that's me. And sometimes, and this is, and that's why this is one of the most comforting passages to me, because when I read this, I think the apostle Paul. Wow, but this is describing me. And um, it's encouraging. Now, listen to me. When we come to this and we really expound this and preach this next week, I want you to know, make no mistake. We are not using this passage or this series of messages in Romans chapter seven as an excuse to sin. Um, that would defeat the whole purpose of this teaching. That would defeat the whole context of this, which really begins at the end of chapter five. When Paul says, when sin increases, where, where sin increased, grace super increased, super exceeded. My, you know, where sin increases, sin abounds, grace super abounds is what he says. And the, and the answer to that of many people would be, wow. So the more I sin, the more there's grace. So praise the Lord, I can get my ticket to heaven and I can still enjoy my sins here. Because the more I sin and the more my sin abounds, grace super abounds. So praise the Lord. Hey, I can see him because amen is covered in the blood and once saved, always saved. 
And Paul is using Romans 6 and 7 to refute that thinking. May it never be. That's called licentiousness. That is licentiousness is, is of those who see grace as a license to sin. That's called antinomianism. Oh my goodness, what are you talking about, preacher? Antinomianism. That's a word that means against the law. That's a word that means people who, wait a minute, the law's in the Old Testament, grace is in the New Testament. We don't live under the law anymore. We live under grace. Forget the law. Forget the Ten Commandments. We can't keep them anyway. And we really don't like them. I don't want to have to keep those commandments. Praise the Lord for grace. Free grace to sin as I want, but still get to heaven. And yeah, that's antinomianism. Just sin as you like, because we all fail anyway. So um and so that's what Paul is refuting in these chapters. So may it never be that I am using this, that I say it's a comfort to me as an excuse to sin. So I want to say that first. OK, and um, here's what I want to say, secondly, about this passage. And I want to encourage you to read Romans 6, 7 and 8 and just meditate on those. If you want to add to it, meditate on Romans 5, 6 seven and eight and just meditate on those chapters next week as we come back to this next week okay but here's what we know about this passage in romans chapter 7 verses uh, 13 through 25 there's been a lot of controversy about this passage there's been a lot of arguments um, of men in the past godly men who see it different there's been a lot of arguments about this is this speaking of a saved person or an unsaved person? Is Paul talking about his life before he was saved? Or is he talking about his life after he saved? Well, I want to make it very clear to you. I just don't see an argument there. And, uh, and I'm in pretty good company because I've been reading a lot of godly men of the past and the present who agree that, number one, we need to understand this passage is not speaking of an unsaved person, okay? This is a man, if you read this passage, this is a man who has come to see the spirituality of God's law and the goodness of God's law and the holiness and righteousness of God's law. And this is a man who, when he sees the goodness and righteousness and holiness of God's law, he has seen the wretchedness and sinfulness of his own heart. That's not the heart of, a, uh, of an unsaved person, folks. Also, we know from this passage, this is a man who understands his own sinfulness. Oh, it's clear in these verses. Just read them. Also in this passage, we know that this is a man that's in a battle. He, there's a dual nature going on. I'm going to talk about that. This is a man in this passage that's sick of sin and tired of sin. And in one sense, he's defeated, but he's fighting. Uh, this is a man in this passage that understands who Christ is and what he's done for him on the cross. This is a man that longs to be set free from this body and set free from sin for good. And he longs for holiness. Folks, that's clear in this passage. That's not the heart of an unsaved person. So I'm telling you, we're talking about a saved man in Romans chapter 7. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, and we're going to talk about it. So, um, and so let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Y'all hanging with me? Okay, praise the Lord. Um, I remember, uh, you know, someone, as I was reading uh, Charles Spurgeon, I believe it was, on this passage, he was saying, the Apostle Paul, who we look up to, folks, you have the same Holy Spirit as the Apostle Paul. The same graces that saved him and enabled him to live are the same graces that saved you and enables you to live the Christian life. And I was reminded also early in my ministry, I remember a man came to me when I was getting ready to be pastor of the church. And he just said, I'm just be honest with you. I just think you're too young and you're too inexperienced. And I looked at him with confidence and I said, you know, I am young and inexperienced. But I'm going to tell you something because this man loved Billy Graham. I said, you know what? I have the same Holy Spirit and the same Bible that Billy Graham has. And that's true. And I wasn't being uh, proud, prideful by that, by that. I really meant that. So here's what I want to say this morning. I want us to, I want us to see, and, and I said I was going to be short, didn't I? But the Lord's helping me. We're already 24 minutes in. Wow. Listen to me. Now, I promise we're going to come back and we'll cover 
verses 23 through verses 25 really good next week. But I'm just giving you a little bit of an appetite for it. I'm just giving you a little preview of it. Now, here's what I want to tell you. I want you to see. Uh, I, I, I want you to see the two natures within from this passage. I want you to keep that in mind for next week. OK, there's too much proof in this passage that this is a saved person. We've already covered that. OK, lost people. And here here we go. I want you to see the dual the the duality. Am I saying that right? Oh, well. The dual nature within a saved person. I mean, here it is again. Verse 21, I find then a principle, a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, the, the new man within, the, the, the saved man. But I say another law in my members. When he talks about his members there, he's talking about his body. His real hands, his real eyes, his real mouth and taste, his real feet, his real bodily desires. We all have them. And when we desire to fulfill those, when we want to fulfill those desires in ways that God has not provided, that's sinful. And, and this flesh, this, this body, that's what he's talking about. The, there's another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. Uh, verse 25b, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This dual nature within us. Listen to me. Lost people, people who are not saved, they only have one nature. And I'm going to show you that real quick. Look over in John chapter 3 with me. Okay, just go on a journey with me real quick. We'll be almost done in a minute. I told you I'm going to be short. Look over in John chapter 3 with me. Okay, you, you going? Let's journey. Come on. Open your Bibles. Had a, had a preaching professor that told us a sweet sound when you're preaching churches will be The rustling of the Bible pages and the fingertips of the members listening and journeying through the scriptures with the man of God preaching. John chapter 3. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Verse 3. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Most of you know that that word born again, if you look it up, it literally means born from above. And then he goes on to say, um, uh, verse five, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's an unsaved man right there. That which is born of the flesh. We're all born of the flesh and we're flesh and we're in this body and we have one nature when we're born. That's what he's saying there. And then he says, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Jesus is talking about that a new birth must occur for us to be saved. We need to be born from above. We're flesh. We're, we're, in, we're in Adam. We're dead in our sins. And we need, we need a new nature. And that's what being born again means. It means to be born from above. It means where God miraculously implants new life within us. Hey, he gives us a new heart, praise the Lord. And then we have two natures, but lost people only have one nature. Look over in Ephesians. We're journeying real quick. Look over in Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Lost people have not been made alive. They are dead. In their trespasses and sins. And that's where I was. And that's where you were before you were saved. One nature. One nature. In our flesh. In Adam. Dead. How about Colossians? Journey over a couple books with me to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's speaking of the new birth. That's speaking of a transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But one nature before we were saved. And then if you go over to 1 John chapter 3, we don't have time to go there, but go read 1 John chapter 3. Those, those who are born of God and those who are of the devil. 
So what I'm saying to you is that those who are not saved only have one nature. They don't understand this battle that we're talking about here because there's really no battle within them because hey, sin already has them. Satan already has them. You know, I've always said and tried to use this as an illustration. Satan's not going to mess with lost, lost people very much. He's already got them. He's after those who are saved. He wants to destroy our testimony. He wants to lure us back into sin. He wants us to confuse us and make us think that we're not saved. Wow. And then one more. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, the Bible says the natural man cannot understand the things of God. What I'm saying to you is there's a dual nature when we're saved. And there's this battle of the two natures. That's what I want to say before we pray in just a moment. There's a battle going on. We shared it last week. I'm going to introduce you to verses 24 and 25 for next week. So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit implants new life within you. But listen to me. The old nature is still there as long as we're still in this body. And that's what death is. Death is the the departure of the spirit from the body. And that's a glorious thing. Um, death is when the spirit departs and goes back to Jesus. And so as long as we're in this body of sin, as Paul says, the old nature is still there, is still alive and well. You know, if you read the John MacArthur study Bible on these verses, and I'll just read this to you. This is very interesting. Um, let me get, go back to it. Y'all hanging with me? Y'all there? Was this longer than I told you? It always is, isn't it? I'm sorry. But listen, um, I'm looking at the notes of, uh, yeah, this body of death. When he says in verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And, uh, and I heard this from another preacher as well. John MacArthur says of this body of death in the John MacArthur study Bible of verse 24, the believer's unredeemed humanness, which has its base of operation in the body. Then he says, tradition says that an ancient tribe near Tarsus tied the corpse of a murder victim to its murderer allowing its spreading decay to slowly infect and execute the murderer. Perhaps that is the image Paul has in mind. And, uh, and I would agree with that, that in a sense, when we're saved, the old nature is still within us. And it's, it's, like, it's like we're a new man, but we're carrying around a dead man, dragging him around all the time. And the thing is, we're always doing battle. Because you see, I used to say the remnants of sin remain. But when I was reading Charles Spurgeon a little bit on this passage, he said, oh, friends, the remnants of sin doesn't remain within the Christian. The whole of sin, in a sense, remains. We're, we're, we're still, the sinful nature is still there as long as we're in this body of death. The flesh and blood and sin nature is still there and we have to drag it around. And look, we can't improve the old nature. That's why, that's why when we, plead with people to come to Christ to be saved. We know that self-helps don't, don't help a person. It's not right to tell somebody to go get self-helps and go to this program and that program. And to do it without Christ is terrible um, because you're, 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 you're still dead in your trespasses and sins. But anyway, we can't improve on the sinful nature. We can't make it better. We're defeated within ourselves. And that's what Paul is saying here that's going to lead us to the rest of this that we're going to talk about next week. He is saying in verses 23, 24, and 25 that I'm finding this dual nature, nature I'm finding this battle, and sin is winning out. The sinful nature is stronger than that of my mind and the inner man in itself. Now, remember the context, folks. Y'all with me? Remember the context. The context is, number one, just because where sin abounds, grace abounds, that doesn't mean we're free to sin as we like, so grace may increase. But then secondly, when we talk about the law killed us and we're no longer under law, but we're under grace, Paul jumps in Romans 7 to defend that and say, that doesn't mean that the law is bad. 
And that doesn't mean that we just sweep the law away and we don't worry about the Ten Commandments and God's moral law, law anymore. You've missed it. That's what Paul is saying in Romans 7. Oh, no, the law of God is good. And we love the law now that we're saved. And we want to keep the law for uh, uh, not to be saved and not to stay saved. That's a key of Romans 7 too. He is also teaching us that we cannot be saved by keeping God's law outwardly. And we can't stay saved by keeping God's law because we can't keep God's law. It, it's, we see it and it condemns us. And, but it's good. I'm the problem. Sin is the problem. That's what he's saying in Romans 7. And now he's saying, you know, there's this battle within me and I, I want to live for Christ. I want to obey God's law. But I find a stronger principle within me that sin is there in my body. And I find myself falling into sin instead of serving God and obeying his law. And Oh, wretched. Oh, the cry of despair in verse 25. That's where we're going to leave it. But faint not, Christians, because there's victory. And uh, this is this is in our flesh, in our body. But, oh, in Romans 8, we're going to talk about how to walk in the spirit. Praise the Lord. All right, before we go, uh, Brother Joe, I see you put a few comments on here. I'll share those. Um, what Brother Joe say? We all have spots on our garments. Our brothers may see none, but we see some. God sees all. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, I got a greetings from Costa Rica. Greetings, my brothers and my sisters in Costa Rica. Thank you for listening. Praise the Lord. Brother Joe says, we hate the spots in our garments. Not glory in them. Amen. We hate to see that. That's right. The, the true saved man hates to see that sin still within us. Brother Joe, dig, dead dogs float downstream. Live ones swim upstream. He, Brother Joe is the master of the, the illustrations for the common man. The master. You need to write a book, Brother Joe. Illustrations for the common man. You really do. And I love this. Who wants to be sober without salvation? That's dangerous. Hey, thank you all for watching. Would you please pray about partnering with us and helping us? There's so many ways that you can partner with us. Just please contact me. I love you all. Thank you all. Let's pray together. And I promise next week we'll be faithful to expound verses 23 through 25. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you help us to be faithful to the end? Would you help us to be faithful in reading your scriptures and depending on your Holy Spirit to help us? And Lord, I pray for those who might be watching who might not be saved right now. Please draw them to Jesus, Lord. Oh, Father, draw them to Jesus, we pray. And Father, for those who are watching who are believers, strengthen them, Lord. Comfort them. And we love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for watching. Praise the Lord. I'll be back next week with more on this. God